This is Coder Radio, episode 369, for August 5th, 2019. Welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show that takes a pragmatic look at the art and business, software development, and related technologies, and probably a few other things this week because, while well, I'm normally joined by Mr. Michael Dominic, today he's out sick. You know, you gotta heal. You gotta, you gotta take your health seriously, as my perhaps reluctant co-host knows very very well. Welcome to the show again, Chris. Hello, Mr. Payne. My plans of slowly poisoning Mr. Dominic while he travels so I can regain my place here on the show have come to fruition. I assumed he was just in danger living in Florida anyway, right? That's not it's not yeah. safe down there. And whenever you got a kid, you're just going to get sick. You're like a target, man. Huh. You're like a target. But I'm glad I could be here. And really, I kind of miss doing the show. So it's nice to have an opportunity to come on, although it's it's not the same without Mike. It certainly isn't. And actually, it's kind of good you're here today because let's start with some feedback. There's a feedback you might be able to help me with. Hmm. All right. So um, over on coderadio.reddit.com, that's right, we do have a subreddit. User Bork Dude, who I will note is a prolific member of the Clojure community. You'll see him making all kinds of neat utilities, writing excellent blog posts, and helping users out on the Clojure subreddit all the gosh darn time. He writes, I'm looking for a good mic for voice recording, since I'll be a guest on a podcast soon. Mm. Since you sound good in your shows, thank you. Can you share what mics you're using? And, you know, I, I know a thing or two about this, too. You've been doing this a long time, and it can be especially tricky it's one thing to do it when you got, you know, production budget. And it's another one, mm. you know, you just need to sound good enough. Yeah, and first of all, it's, it's really kind of him to consider that on the beha- on the behalf of the podcast. Oh my gosh, so much so. Right? Thank you for just thinking of that. Plus, it's kind of nice, even if you're not like going to be a guest on a podcast or you're not planning to record an audiobook anytime soon, it's kind of nice to have a decent microphone for meetings, Jumping on a you know a call, maybe you want to do a call from your PC to your desktop. It's just nice to have a good microphone in general, but you don't need to spend hundreds of dollars. Right. So there are a couple that I do recommend. Um, I was trying to remember before the show, and I, I, I figured it out. And I'll put a link in the show notes. If you just want to get started with something that hooks up over a USB, the one thing I'm going to ask of you is make sure you buy a microphone that has a headphone jack. So you can do what's called local monitoring. That is so important. Right. And it also, if you're using Linux or something like that, just makes things a little bit easier because it just shows up as an output device and whatnot. Uh, but I really like, for the entry level, that still sounds pretty great. Like, you could you could start a podcast with this. The Audio-Technica ATR2500 USB condenser microphone. Uh, it's 70 bucks. Primable. That's, that's hard to beat. Yeah, and it, it'll it be your audio in and your audio out. It's all you need, so you don't have to buy an audio interface or anything like that. Um, it's really nice and straightforward. Another solid microphone that I've used for years that's a little more expensive, similar thing, the Rode Podcaster. Oh, Pretty right. good microphone. And then if you want to step things up from there, uh, there's things like the High LPR 40 or the... Um, uh, what's the Rogan mic that people love that uh, it doesn't work for my voice? But... Oh, the uh, SM7B. Yes. So there's a, there's you know there's tons of good mics when you want to start going up. And just one thing to keep in mind is like I just said there, like not every mic works for everybody. I bought this nice microphone thinking, oh, I'm gonna sound great now. Works great on the Joe Rogan podcast. I put it on and I I hated the way yeah, I sounded. Like, no, this, this is not for me. <laughs> So yeah, you will probably have to experiment, and there are probably a couple different price levels, right? You have you have nice USB ones, and if it's just sort of like I'm an occasional guest and for conference calls, that's the level. If you're doing something more serious, then maybe you, you want to look into XLR-based mics and getting a real interface. But then you're probably going to be out what 300, 400 bucks by the end of it. Yeah, yeah. As you well know, there's there's uh, well there's a price for everybody, really. But yeah, three hundred something bucks, you could probably get something pretty usable. Um, If you're thinking about starting a podcast, maybe your business wants to do a podcast or you personally want to start one, I I have to recommend a friend of the show, Dan Benjamin's podcast method. Just go Google that. It's on the 5 by 5 network. Uh, And uh, rumor has it, rumor has it, a little birdie tells me that it's about to start back up. It's been on a hiatus since uh, 2017, but rumor has it it's about to start very soon. And the podcast method 
26 episodes deep, so it wouldn't take you that long to go through it. In 26 episodes, you'd, you'd basically know how to run a network. <laughs> I mean, it's really a, it's an in-depth thing. And he covers everything from gear to uh, technique. So that's uh, the podcast method. Yeah, we'll have some mics yeah. linked there in the show notes. Again, over. it was the Audio Technica ATR 2500 USB. And I really recommend you get the USB edition because you're going to need to get yourself a USB audio interface if you go with anything that's XLR or analog. Like a headset that comes in over a, like a microphone plug, like a little tiny one, that needs to go into something besides your machine that has a built, your built-in port if you want it to sound decent. Yeah, you need to know how you sound. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you got to be able to hear it. Excellent. Well, that's a great question. Good luck. And uh, I guess we look forward to listening to you on that podcast soon. Boston. And you say he's uh, busy, he's active, I should say, in the closure community? Oh, yes, very much so. Put a link in the uh, subreddit on the podcast. Submit to the sub- Coder Radio yeah, subreddit. Yeah, once it's out, let us know and uh, yeah. we'll recommend it here for sure. That's really neat. You got uh, you got people in the closure community listening to the show now, don't oh, you? Love it. <laughs> well done, sir. <laughs> so I wonder how the... Uh, I wonder how the old uh, closure community felt felt about Mike's take. <laughs> that's a that's a good question. We got some good uh, you know good feedback on Twitter about it Did too. You? So yeah, I'll and wait for him to come back. Yeah, I there's suppose. some other feedbacks yeah. and people were were being helpful. So we'll definitely talk more about that. Helpful? They're I mean, helpful? sometimes, sometimes, some okay. of it's helpful. Yeah. All right. You're so jaded. No, you know, you know. I guess. Well, uh, Mr. Payne, since Mr. Dominic isn't here, is it okay if I bring a couple of stories to the class? Yeah, of course. There's, a, there's one that you found, which is the exact opposite of a story I found. Oh, boy. So I thought that'd be kind of interesting to talk about this week. And it's about uh, the plight of browser extension developers. So uh, the first one is a link that you found. Google and Mozilla are failing to support browser extension developers. And it's a good case. It was just recently published, and you, you'll have a link in the show notes. Um, but I, got, I grabbed a couple of things from it, and I thought we, this would be good, like, uh, you know, fodder for conversation. Uh, So the author writes, it's a regular occurrence to hear open source developers are selling their browser extensions only for their users to then be exploited later on by new owners. Yeah, right. We've seen a ton of these lately. You build up, you know, a handful of users, you monetize them, you sell them off. Um, He writes, we are, or she writes, we are witnessing the failure of of browser vendors to recognize the value of our labor and the important role it plays in a healthy browser ecosystem. They go on to say, Mozilla has deprioritized the placement of donation buttons, and the Chrome Web Store and the Microsoft Store do not offer features for supporting extension developers at all. How, how important are extensions to why you use a web browser? Mm, they, are, they play a small really? role. Um, really? I, mean, there's, I can think of a few that we use pretty regularly, and they're not, it's not essential it would be a factor, right? Like if you, once you have started using extensions, unless there is a direct equivalent or the extension is available in both places, it's at least a small disincentive to, such, mm-hmm. to shift. I mean, for me, it's pretty strong because a, a, a big part of my day job is collecting information from the web that I'm going to use for, uh, you know, consideration in a show later. So I want to do research or reading or I want to mark it up or I want to save a link. And a lot of that workflow uses extensions. And for me, it's it's sometimes been like the thing that keeps me on Chrome, for example, or what kept me on Firefox for so long. And in fact, there's even there's even forks of Firefox to support the old uh, right. Netscape plugin API. Oh boy! So it's obviously super important to some people. And this author is making the case that there's really no support from the browser manufacturers. Yeah, I think the analogs to um, you know some other things we've seen more platforms that have extensibility, things like Alexa skills or you know. Could just think in case, it. just in case. But we, it, it, does, it does seem like some platforms expect there to be this sort of user-provided content. Thinking about how that gets monetized, if you want it to exist, seems like it makes sense. Anything of certain complexity, port requirements, needs a form of monetization just to be sustainable, I right. suppose. And that's really where the issue kind of comes up. Now, th- so that's the story you found. Now, the story I found which is like an exact contrast and, and maybe explains the entire problem, is half of Google Chrome extensions have fewer than 16 installs. Wait, 16? Six, yeah. In all, about 50% of all Chrome extensions have fewer than 16 installs, meaning that half of the Chrome extension ecosystem is basically a ghost town. This is according to a recent scan of the entire Chrome Web Store conducted by Extension Monitor. 
Interesting. Now, I, I do wonder, I'd like to see some more detailed statistics because it's kind of it's kind of hard to say. And it does, I mean, it does make sense, right? How many extensions do you use to install? A handful? More than I should. And probably most of them, or the you know the most essential ones are one, the popular ones, right? Like there's a couple nice ones that you get, like, you know, HTTPS everywhere maybe, or there's a certain ad blocker that you use. But it's yeah. a rapid decline of like... I've got, I've got 15 that I can count oh, wow. um, just in my toolbar. <laughs> I mean, it's okay. So you have a so few here, more than I here, do. I'll, I'll, it's a Markdown link generator, uh, oh. LastPass, the template extension, which is just a remarkable piece of engineering because you can make your own extensions out of it, uh, and it's how I can copy entire sections of an article, and then it will go get the URL and the title of the document, and then it'll and I can just paste mm, that whole thing. That like, is that is nice. It's a really nice extension, and there's a good community around it. The other one I have is Imager Reupload. This is one I'll use to share like an image with the team a lot. I'll capture something and I'll use this just to repost on Imager. So you capture this and then it just gives you a little selection window and then just repost it up on Imager and oh, generate nice. the URL in your clipboard. Right. Skip all the part where you like take a screenshot and save it and then open an Imager tab and then upload it. Right. Um, I now have switched to using a pinboard extension. I used to use a JavaScriptlet bookmark or whatever you call them, but... Now ad blockers and Chrome's built-in protection, they block all that. So I have an extension for that. Um, I have the Reddit enhancement suite because I use Reddit enough to just sure. make it a little bit better. I'm also using uBlock Origin because um, I, I just... I don't think you need to justify yeah, that okay. one. It just it makes it more readable, right? It, yeah. And then a tool that we use internally, Digo, D-I-I-G-O, which is a, it's a highlighting tool. And then I have Web Cache Viewer Clear, so I can oh, either clear smart. my web cache or I can view the web cache version of a document. Um, then I have uh, a, some buttons to subscribe in Feedly. I have an Evernote extension, Dark Reader, and uh, some YouTube plugins as well as uh, Seven Geese, which is our OKR software, and um, Grammarly. Nice. Okay. Well, that's fairly reasonable. And a lot of those, right? There's like there's a couple. A couple ones that are like open source and have communities. There's several mm-hmm. probably that are proprietary or at least supported by a uh, you know. And you know how bad company I Grammarly. You know that. Yes, I do. I need a bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I kind of am. I I am on edge case. I, I'm get. I'm gathering I think you are, from yeah. this article. I probably have like six or so on really? that on that order. Yeah. And when you um, do you sync them? Do you sync them to a Google account? So when you open up like or a, or a Firefox account, so when you open up your browser, they resync. Like, yes. Are they, okay, that's what I used to. Mm-hmm. Good and bad, actually. It is good and bad. So the article goes on to say further uh, 19,379 extensions, which is just over 10%, have literally zero installs. And uh, further, 25,000 extensions, 13% have just one user. And the scan found that there are very few Chrome extensions that really have managed to establish any really large dedicated user base at all. And according to Extension Monitor, around 87% of all extensions have fewer than 1,000 installs. Now you contrast to the other story that says the browser manufacturers aren't properly supporting them. Mm-hmm. Why would they? There's, there, there doesn't seem to be user demand, unfortunately. Well, yeah, it is a kind of a funny thing, right? Because most of the people that use browsers aren't you know, super into technology. A browser is like a key component of a computer, so you do not need to be an expert or even interested in doing anything but going to Facebook to use mm. a browser, right? So why would you... You may not know extensions are a thing, and I think... Perhaps rightfully so, in the push to security, extensions have been downplayed a lot, right? I mean, unless you already know they exist, maybe they get suggested to you, maybe? Yeah, I think you just nailed it in in two different ways there. So the number one thing that you said is the user base. There's so many users that the power users that would be using extensions would be a minority because they're just a small fraction. Yeah. And then to your other point, you're right. They have been sort of reduced in functionality. They're not quite as powerful as extensions were uh, in the first iteration of browser extensions, they're not, they don't fundamentally change the game necessarily. And a lot of these are really more about tying into web services. When I like LastPass, Grammarly, Digo, Evernote, these are really about tying into web services more than anything else. Imager. So. Yeah, right. So, unless you're already running a web service, then, mm-hmm. and then that falls into the category that we already talked about. 
And if I wasn't a user of any one of these individual services, I wouldn't bother with his extension. Not, no. So I'm, again, I'm going to be a minority slice of the overall browser market. Right, because it's not really a generic browser functionality versus your, you know, your templates tool, for instance, which is, right? That's just kind of extending and making your browser more useful. Mm-hmm. And you can also see where the incentive is for the browser manufacturers. It makes sense to incentivize your last passes and your Evernotes and your Grammarly's to create browser extensions. But, uh, you know, Joe Adblock creator... Um, who gets a thousand users, mm-hmm. just not worth Google's time. From the developer perspective, too, I mean, it just seems like I might write an extension if one doesn't exist and I just like really need it, need to do this functionality and I can, you know, slam together some JavaScript or something. But why you would, I don't think you would do it, f- you know, when extensions kind of were first coming onto the scene. I'm thinking like early Firefox, you know, as, as they were getting developed, they were exciting. But now we live in like an, an open source world. They're old news? Yeah, they're old news, right? I mean, no one thinks about it. You're familiar with like popular open source projects, but you don't get the same kind of control, right? You're forever dodging around and playing ball with whatever the browsers want to do, and you're always going to be sort of, you know, second name. You're, you're like, sure, you make this cool project that you spend a lot of time on, but it's just an f- extension that maybe works in one browser. I guess it's in a way the market works these things out. I think so. But you yeah. have people on either ends that are, some people are suffering and some people are prospering. And uh, uh, it's interesting to see both percolate in one week in the in the different links that we collect. And it does seem, yeah, it's like um, it makes sense. It's not working. Uh, if people want it to work, then there are probably things we could do. And it doesn't seem like there are people that care that much. You also found a link in here about uh, a Medium post that was, I think the title was, All of the Best Engineering Advice That I Stole from Non-Technical People. And it reminded me about one of my favorite bosses back in the day when I worked in IT. She was not necessarily inherently technical. She joined the company that was a, it was a cooking company. They, they made food. And, uh, well, they're out of business. So the, the, uh, the company was called Dream Dinners. And the idea was you'd go on their website. And this was when web applications were very new. You'd go on their website and they'd have a monthly menu. You'd put together an order. You submit it to the system, you'd pay for it. Mm-hmm. And then you'd go to one of their franchise locations and actually assemble the Whoa. And then you put it in a bag and take it home and you got like you got like the month's dinners. The downside was you had to go do the work. They later they later started doing the work <laughs> for you, trying to be competitive. Right. But the other side was like you just you just spent two hours and you had a month's worth of food. All the ingredients were there for you, right? You kind of just put you them together. You added your own garlic. If you liked, you know, there was no like limit. So if you wanted four scoops of garlic, you could make it extra garlic. And I do. Or if you don't like garlic, you leave it all out. So that was the benefit. And you could be kind of menu selective and get something that was sort of tailored to your needs. And um, I'll tell you the one time that we really found it very useful because I got an employee discount was right after Angela gave birth to our first son. Oh, yeah. And it was like, we just wanted to not have to worry about food for a month. And we just stacked before before the due date, we just stacked the freezer full of dinners. That's great. And so there, there was a pretty significant a technology backend that I was responsible for that made it all possible because the franchise was doing well for a while. <laughs> That's a different story. Anyways, uh, one of the things is the, the 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 gal that ended up being the IT director started more in the food side of the operation. Oh, yeah, sure. But she was a very clever, intelligent individual, and she worked her way up into the IT position because she was always, Elaine was the one that everybody went to to go fix their computers. That person. It's just, yep, they're competent. Yeah. They figured it out, yeah. And as that position evolved and as that company grew over time, she retained the IT management position and got a team under her. And, I, and as the server side grew out, I, I became the, the Linux server admin. And she was, she was the probably one of the best bosses I've ever had. She had a really good sense. She had a good intuition of, tr- of knowing when to trust like what the team was saying and when to ask further questions. Right. And derive, like, she just listened. You know, she listened and was able to derive what our intention was and ask some details, you know, get the, get the right things, like, kind of out of us. And it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a really good, really good combination while it lasted. It didn't last forever. Right. Again, that's another story. So this article you linked, all of the best engineering advice I stole from non-technical people. Number one, people like us make our money in the seams of things. And the whole the whole thing goes on about uh, how they brainstorm, how they do their work, um, and it reminded me a lot about listening, asking the right questions. Even if you're not a, even if you're not a technical person, you can still you can actually still be a really solid contributor. Oh yeah, in right. that environment. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's so many things of business and just life are like 
process, right? And and every everyone has to do those things. Building now. a house or building a server. Right. Yeah. And there are some people I think that are receptive or intuitive or open to learning, uh, accepting when they don't know things and listening, like you say, right? And that means you can thrive in those environments. Because if you can figure out who to trust and who the experts are and know who to listen to, you can perhaps effectively, you know, bridge information. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you get a you get a sense of who is authoritative on what topics and a sense of their track record over time. I think something that we uh we get kind of wrong in our industry in our community is uh oh you weren't uh, you weren't around in the days of uh, small hard drives. You know, I used to only have 640 kilobytes of RAM and uh, my onboard storage was only 2 megabytes. Yikes. And we get kind of uh, caught up in uh, you, you didn't earn your way. You didn't uh, how dare you come in here with your cloud. Right? Right? We've suffered and somehow that means we we require that from everyone else. Huh, you, that is what it is, isn't it? That's <laughs> I mean, it happens all over the place, right? In so That's many horrible. elements. And there is a certain aspect of like, you do need to put in your time to to learn things and get experience. And like, there's mm-hmm. some things like wisdom or whatever mm-hmm. that just take time to get. But at the same time, people, you know, there are different paths all the time. And I don't know about you, but I frequently am impressed. I mean, I'm thinking specifically in like software, but really in other fields too, Sometimes the people who are the best at it, you know, didn't have the traditional path. They didn't get the right degree or whatever, you know, but they've migrated later into the field and can be some of the best, best, most interesting perspective people. Does that still work now? That's one of the things I've been wondering. Like, if I was to hit the reset button, would I have to go through a certain educational route to even make a break now? Because I just went right from high school into work. And then I did college sort of as part of additional training that Mm. work paid for. That's nice. I, it was like, you know, not something, I didn't go high, I didn't go middle school, high school, college. I went middle school, high school work. And then over a period of six, seven, eight years, attended different college courses. And that was the trajectory that worked perfectly for me. But I don't know if starting today, if you could even pull that off. You know, it, I think that's definitely been true. And, and a, um, like a bachelor's degree does sort of feel like a, a little stamp you have to get just to you know, get your resume looked at sometimes. I think that has changed for the better somewhat. And audience, if you agree, disagree, let us know. Coder.show slash contact. I, I think the tech industry in particular, at least in some some of the larger companies even, has has more of a, rec, you know, a reflection of that. And if you can get away maybe from the more traditional companies and get to a, a more modern tech mm. company, I think there's a more fresh perspective because... It's almost like you can code it, you can't, right? So especially with this culture of, you know, like intense interviews that do maybe maybe not the right relevant challenge. And that's that's another topic for another show, that is of another course. Show. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can just prove yourself. Or in the world of open source too, right? You can be like, well, look, yeah, I didn't, I don't have a CS degree. I maybe don't have a degree at all, but I've contributed to these six projects and everyone likes me and my, here's my PRs. And So this is where I was going. Or is that the other route? Um, because I look at some of the things that are really making money at the infrastructure level, disclaimer. And there isn't there there is no five years. There is no five years to be had in some of these technologies. There no. is no like long experience because they're so new. And 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 I hate to say this as somebody who's been doing this for a long time, but like uh, in some ways, too much experience is almost. You have to be deficit. willing. You have to be willing to throw out, right? Like you can't. Yeah. You can't stick it, to things the way you do in other fields. Because if you so, uh, if somebody like a company were to hire me right now to like move their IT infrastructure to the cloud, I would just essentially recreate their on-premises setup in the cloud. Like I do some the old virtual machines, and, and yeah, and that would be that would be my approach. And okay, everything's in the cloud now. Um, it's like I'm almost. I'm, you almost need somebody who doesn't you know. have too much experience. Does that does that make sense? Right. Well, because they would be open. They would be like, "Well, what does the cloud say that you know?" I'll go. I'll go look at the documentation for whatever provider, and they're probably going to point to like, "Yeah, you could you could you know bring your database over, or well, we'll sell you a database. No problem. We have it managed. It has backups. Here's how it works. Here's the availability of it." I don't think it's impossible for the old dog to learn new tricks. It's just a matter of time and energy that you have to spend on trying out new things when what you've right. been doing for so long works. Um, so for an example, this is just a small one, but we had a system here that was a very traditional storage approach to, to you know, it's a, it's a box, it runs free NAS, it's an appliance, we put storage on mm-hmm. it, and we don't touch it. 
And it was sort of an old school way of thinking that we had another box that connected to that over network storage that ran the virtualization. And um, it was two really loud hot boxes running here in the studio that we just didn't need. And then we decided, well, let's let's revamp this approach and let's take a look at how we can do all of this on one machine and utilize containers for for the applications, which uh, if we're not using VMs, means we could stack all of this on one machine. And it, it sort of shifted the way I look at building out infrastructure and the way I look at application portability. And it wasn't so much that I wasn't willing to try it. It was more that... I hadn't really had an opportunity to try something different from what had been working for so long. Right. I mean, there is still some wisdom to the, you know, don't don't fix it if it isn't broken. But that only depends, right? Everything's a, a trade-off, a cost-benefit. So there is there's a cost, right? Like, we had to redo a bunch of things. But the benefit has definitely outweighed it, I think. I mean, I would I don't think it's a exaggeration to say we're, it's like we're getting 10x the use out of the machine now. So if we're going to run that, so we've, we've con- we consolidated down to one machine. So we're using less power, and we're getting 10 times the use. I also just feel better about it, too. You know, like if we needed to go rebuild it again, it wouldn't be a big deal. I mean, we'd have to replace the hardware or whatever, but the software part would be easy. I think the part for me was I had like a, oh, I get it moment. Um, and I think that might be what's it's important about taking somebody who's used to doing it one way. Like the, you and I, we both know an individual who... He'll only do something one way for the rest of his life until like some really earth shattering reason came up. And if it's personal life stuff, if it's IT stuff, and and that's a that's not an uncommon way of looking at things. Um, and for me, it, it was I just didn't didn't quite see the utility. It wasn't like I wasn't going to do it. I just didn't quite see the utility until I had like the oh I get it moment. And for me, that was that was working with Docker Compose. And having that experience of ripping down a dozen applications running on a server that were in the middle of doing something even. Right, In yeah. one case, one time we did it, they were in the middle of processing something. <laughs> we ripped them all down and then used Docker Compose to just pull down the latest versions of those images and stand everything back up again. And everything just picked right back up. Like, in three minutes... We had new versions of all of the software. We had the latest versions of all of the software. We had proven to me that the data and the config were both separate and safe. Right. And that the application was ephemeral. And when I and and it was one line on the command line, because everything's in this super easy to read YAML file that I literally can just just it's clear. It's yeah, just, right. Just I mean read, it just kind of tells you if you know anything about Docker at all. It's all laid out. It's all there. You don't you don't even need to know anything about Docker. You just need to know things about the fundamentals, like the basic fundamentals. Yeah, exactly. And it's all clear to you. It's like, oh, it's this is how it works. Oh, God, that's so simple. Um, and so when I was able to tear it all down, update it, and stand it all up, and have it just pick right back up in the processing, it just it resumed. The, it, the, this particular job was resumable. <sighs> Psh, you know, changed everything. It, it, it kind of makes me think too of a, like a little bit of like when I first discovered like the Unix command line. And I had yeah, all these yeah. different tools, and I could I could put them together. I, I you know yes. they would they would work together, and that's true with Docker too. But Docker Compose just takes it to the next level, and I mean it's right there in the name, of course. <laughs> it lets you compose them together, and then you can feel like, oh yeah, here's all my little pieces that I need for my distributed system, which is what we are all all building these days. And then it helps you cleanly latch them together. My bad, really, for not uh, coming up with a reason to try it sooner. Because um, I thought I had done a good enough job reading and conversing about it that I understood it. Yeah, I mean, you know, you only have a few related shows. Yeah, and uh, I got the concepts. Oh, you know, you tear down the software, stand it back up. Okay, I get it. I get it. But when it was software that in the past I would spend a week configuring, I would spend like five days in the evening. Tweaking, tuning, getting it just right that I had personally spent my time over the years managing, right? And then then to see this difference where it was like 30 seconds and everything was right back up and running, uh, that's when it really became practical to me. That's when it that's when it shifted. I'm like, oh, okay, so I'm never doing it the old way ever again. I'm never going back. And there's just um, you know, we were, we were talking about this on Linux Unplugged, but there's a, you know, I think it took time for these things to work for the kind of tasks you're doing because they they're techniques born out of like you know, scale where you where if you do it the traditional way, at some point it's just it's not going to work. There's too many moving factors. There's too much moving state everywhere. 
And uh, I think it just take, took some time for the tooling to get to a place where even if you're doing this all on one box and you just you know you want to go real quick and you don't need to custom spend hours customizing every little thing, you don't have to now. And it's not just uh, it's not just for web applications. Like we're kind of thinking about using Docker for some even some recording uses. Do yeah. you want to? I don't think we talked about this, but no, that's true. We are creating for the purposes of recording. I should say it's really for production purposes. It may be consumable by others, but it's really for our own production purposes. And we're going to nickname it the Jack in the Box because it's a Jack audio system, a rather sophisticated Jack audio system, but not not too sophisticated. That is in a Docker layer that our hosts can install on their system, connect their in and outs to, and essentially have a Jupiter Broadcasting contained recording environment. I mean, really, it's. It's kind of living up in the name of of Docker, right? And that's the whole thing. It's like you just, all right, we have some hardware. We need that. You take the container. You got to set up the right sort of actual docking interfaces, right? Get all the right supply lines, access to the sound devices in this case, for instance. But then the software part's unchanged. It's the same. Now, it probably won't be so easy because Linux Audio never is. Mm-hmm. But it is a, it's just like it's super useful that we could just do that and have it reliable and not have to do, especially when you might be running some software that, you know, either it's proprietary or you have to custom compile it or you need a lot of install dependencies that may or may vary, you know, may or may not vary between distributions. It gives us a few tools, though. Uh, the first, using Jack, which is an audio subsystem for Linux, it allows us to do equalizing and compression. It allows us to sort of guarantee a certain sound that gets sent out to the live stream while also recording a certain dry audio for post-processing. So that's pretty fancy right there. There's certain things we can do with it down the road. But there's other things we can do that are are kind of down down the road, maybe, maybe going to use, maybe we never would. But if it's a Docker image that's actually up on the Docker hub, in theory, Wes could tweak something Send it up and then tell the host, okay, go update your Docker images. They go update their images and now they've got the latest tweaks that Wes has applied to our recording layer that they can run on their OS. And that's pretty powerful too because it allows us to sort of neutralize the the distribution because different hosts run different distributions. Yeah, yes, they do. And uh, Mr. Fedora. <laughs> hey. <laughs> um it lets us uh it lets us uh it lets us sort of normalize that out. And it's pretty far from any kind of normal use of Docker that I've seen. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, a lot of those mounts that I'm doing there, you you wouldn't you wouldn't want to do that in production. No. Like I said, it's not a web application. It's not something you're going to host, but it's something that maybe you'd set up on a, a ThinkPad to do recording. Okay, so related, I've been playing a little bit with Podman, and I think technologies you should try that, you know, maybe are a little outside what you're comfortable with now, you should check out the Red Hat container stack. Really? So I think you might like it. Okay. Um, we should probably explain what Podman is for people that aren't familiar with it because it's it's not um, that different. It's it's still container based. It's still the standard containers as you know it, but it sort of replaces the Docker Compose tools in, in that layer, right? We can get to the Compose part, uh, oh. but really it replaces oh. Docker. So no Docker daemon. No, so that's one of the big things. Uh, Podman is a daemonless container engine uh. for developing, managing, and running. OCI containers, don't say Docker containers, they're OCI containers right. on your Linux system. What's, there's, there's a couple really neat things. So first of all, the, the daemonless stuff. That's nice just from security, from many aspects. Podman's been designed, you know, it's newer, right? So it's a little more modern. It takes really nice advantage of all the you know, user namespaces, all, all that stuff right out of the box. And they've done some neat stuff where you can run Podman without being root. Now you can run it as root and it does, you know, still supports all the nice sandboxing and user namespaces, but you can also run it not as root. Now, you probably wouldn't necessarily want to do this in all production scenarios, but they've put in a bunch of work to make that work behind the scenes. So so one example is like network namespaces are used all the time in, in containers, right? Now you can you can create one as an unprivileged user, but you can't make the virtual Ethernet pairs that actually are used to bridge the network namespaces unless you're root. So they have implemented basically a user space TCP IP stack to provide the same connection. And so there's a couple things like that. There's like a fuse file system that gets used for another what, feature. What runs that? What runs that that user level application if there's no daemon? You know, I don't know quite how the process hierarchy works out, but that's all it is because it's, you know, that's all containers are. They're processes with, mm-hmm. you know, in the right mm-hmm. namespace and under the right C groups. I should look more into that. Curious how that, that, that sounds, that does sound very appealing. 
Well, what's nice then too is like, so you can just run it and then, you know, just install Podman. You can then start pulling down. It supports, depending on which distribution you installed, and you might have to go configure like the Docker registry, but it's one of the default ones. So you basically just go tell it which registries you want to talk to, and then you can use it exactly like Docker. It has the same commands. You can just, even some of their docs tell you to alias Podman for Docker so that you just, you know, use it oh, all the same. I was, so that was, <laughs> that was my question. Was like that. That one of the things that, that makes Docker great is the command syntax is simple, and it's you know just because it's so popular, it's kind of become the the de facto. So they're just like uh, have these. Yep, that's ours now. Well, that's kind of nice. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you can just install it, start playing with it, run it, and uh, it's it's nice. Were you doing this on Ubuntu? Mm-hmm. Yeah, huh. they have a, a PPA you can install, no problem. I noticed. I think it's on Fedora thirty. I think it's already on. I think it's already on Fedora thirty because when we were messing around with our new setup. Oh yeah, it definitely is. Um, and they've got you know they've got some other tools there too. So there's a, a building tool that's specific. Podman can build too, but uh, they have Builda. Uh, now it supports building from Docker files, which is which is great. But they also have um, their own support, so you can do really easy stuff like start starting from scratch or like super minimal images. And they're using that for integration. So like there's um, Ansible container, which is a way to use Ansible to build containers. That was kind of hacky the way you had to do it through Docker. And this, um, it's basically just sort of commands. So you say, like, build a run this command in this container that we're working on right now. And then you can, like, commit those changes back to it. So then you can use some sort of interactive script if you have some more dynamic scenario. Oh, that's really nice. Yeah. Or if you have existing Docker files, you can just build them that way too. Okay. So it seems like super obvious. If I'm using Ansible, this is a lot cleaner. Um, I'm not still 100% clear. Like, if I'm, if I'm me, Throwing up some Im- images on a uh, droplet or a, a Linode VPS, I'm still not super clear why I would use Podman over Docker, especially because the Docker Hub is active. Well, so you can still interrupt with Docker Hub, no problem. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Totally. Um, it just natively supports that. It even also makes it Jeez. easy if you want to like you already have images over. So it, you should first know too, like because it's OCI, you know, more OCI inspired and compliant. The containers are under a different path. So when you first install Podman, you'll like to you know try to see if you have anything if you've been using Docker and you won't. But you can tell it to look at the Docker stuff, and it's like makes it easy to transfer. So you can like pull from Docker Hub, you can pull from the Docker daemon on your local system and move images back and forth oh, between really? them. So yeah. it's easy to move over. Oh yeah. Oh, well, that's so. nice. Um, okay. I mean, so I think it's just um it's, it's kind of a it's a kind of a cleaner design, really. Um, so it's a little bit more minimal. You don't have this root daemon running all the time. But for you, yeah. it's probably not. So I think it's still in the uh, play with and evaluate. Hmm. It does have some stuff. So it's got uh, pods, right? Pods is right in the name because Podman is built in, you know, it comes from Red Hat and Red Hat's K- Kubernetes player, right? I mean, OpenShift. So it's very much, you know, built in the Kubernetes era. So it also supports pods, which are much like the analog in Kubernetes where you have these containers sort of joined together. So it can be used somewhat similar to Docker and Compose, but I don't think the level of tooling for that specific use case is quite as nice uh, as Docker Compose. So maybe not quite there, but there's a lot of neat tech. And if you, you know, need to do something a little le- a little more complicated, and you maybe need to customize your really care about how your containers are running or you're concerned about security, these tools are pretty neat. Yeah, I, the, the security aspect of it is very appealing. Um, also, I tend to agree with your assessment that a lot of the tools that I see come out of Red Hat I have two feelings about them. One, God, I wish we had that a year ago. And two, that's a really nice, tight, clean design. Like it's really clean, easy to understand, sensible. Um, not for everything, but for a lot of the tools on the command line, that has generally been my impression. So uh, it seems like it seems like it is something that might be worth giving a little bit of a go. I would my workflow of like having these compose files that I go to that this is like this is this stack of applications, and I have another compose file for that's another stack of applications. That's, that's would, the part I think that would be missing for uh, you. Okay. You know, because okay. Docker Compose adds its own layer of, of orchestrating. So mm-hmm. if you were using Ansible um, or some other things, uh, mm-hmm. right, and it sort of takes it apart. So instead of like, oh, well, like, I want this container running all the time, you know, in order to check on fail or restart, in the, in the Red Hat model, the Podman model, they're like, well, you already have systemd, right? Like, that's already yeah, a thing. Just right. do that. System D is great at it, and it does that for your other services. And that's what I'd prefer. Yeah, right. So it plays really nicely. Maybe if you already are using System D a bunch or other configuration management tooling, um, or alternatively, if you want to run System D 
inside a container, which can be a little bit difficult and hacky sometimes with Docker. Podman supports it right out of the gate. You know, it makes me really think that it's worth spending more time getting into Ansible too. Like maybe it's worth even for our small infrastructure. Oh yeah, no, I mean, I, 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 I think it is. Um, there is certainly overhead in learning new tools um, and you know having to apply them. And there is a certain, you know, you have to assess what can be tricky. And I think is Docker Compose is, is nice. It's working well for us. And But if we do a little bit more, then Ansible makes sense. Yeah. It's just that, like, right, when you, if you don't need to customize, then you want a tool that kind of hides a lot of the stuff from you. But the second you have semi-complicated customization needs, you want a tool that's a little more flexible and ready to go. I mean, the most we have is weird mounts, right? Yeah, so far. Now, where Ansible then gets really nice is right now we would re-image a machine and then install a few things, make a few manual tweaks maybe. And then from the point of starting our Docker Compose, that all would be totally the same. Ansible would just bridge that gap, right? So that we could have the whole system up and running. And you can see it's one of those things where it's like if you're doing one system, it's still better, but it's yeah. less better. And if you're doing 10 systems, it really matters. And if you're doing 1,000 systems, then well, there's no other way to do it. So what about a scenario where I'm developing locally and then I want to deploy on a remote system? Is there a particular advantage to using Podman? Do you think um, you can, you know, it you can have it just do less, I guess, right? Like mm. you can just install. You don't have this daemon running, and the rootless aspect would be nice. Just mm-hmm. be able to, if I, is, I assume it must be like you add your user to a group, then you can use. You don't the tool. even have to do that. Oh, yeah, that's what's nice, right? And and so you don't have to worry that like you having all these people that you've added to the Docker group who are now you know pseudoers. Yeah, um, and there's a good talk. Um, that Red Hat has, has out, and I'll try to find it and add a link to the show notes it's kind of talking about some of these downfalls. The Docker socket is really just a security nightmare in so many things. And because uh-huh. Docker is so hooked into all these low-level kernel primitives... And it's going to be an ongoing soft spot, too. Yeah, you can do stuff where you like change users or get you know new permissions that, under normal circumstances, get logged or audited or the kernel's aware of. But because you take a totally different route concocted by Docker... Right. It's, just, just, it's mostly invisible unless you're actively looking for it. Yeah, again, going back to my general totally outrageous assertment about Red Hat's tools, is that is the great thing, is that they're going to be integrated with the logging, with the rest of the system. Cockpit rolls out, it's got support for it, you can see it in the logs. It's, it is really nice from that standpoint, and it works with the wider tool set. I'm, I'm, I'm convinced, actually. I think I'm going to give it a go right here on the old laptop, because I've, I've got a couple of ideas that I want to try. Yeah, and, and the nice part too is you can you know you can still play together too. So you can do um, you can use Builda and Podman locally to build your images, to test them, to run them on your machine, and then just push the exact same image up to your server when you want to run it with Docker Compose. That's totally fine. Hmm. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty nice. So, um, how many containers have you seen running on a host? I saw this article about taking a system from 30 to 230 Docker containers. Oh, boy. Uh, What are they doing? I don't know. But um, I do kind of wonder, because I'm kind of new to this in actual production and not just screwing around, um, what our limit is. Like, I don't know. Like, I have a better sense because in in VMworld, I carve out 4 gigabytes of RAM. I carve out... 100 gigabytes of disk storage. I allocate this much to that system, and now it's gone. And that math is simple in a way. It is, and it's 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 a cleaner separation of concerns, right? Because you're basically like, all right, well, here's this whole other operating system over here. I will deal with it by itself, and then only if I need to go back up to the hypervisor will I right. even think about that. And maybe the application in that VM consumes all of the resources in, the, in that VM, maybe. Um, but right now, in our setup, an application is just another process on the box. And that, for me, is a weird mental shift because I'm used to it being isolated off into its own machine. And to me, it seems like, I know you can put constraints on it, but it seems possible that just one of those containers could go crazy. One oh, of those, yeah, sure, right? It could fill up all, the, all of its volume space. It yeah. could eat, eat a bunch of CPU. Yeah, that, that to me is the, that's where I can't say, well, we'll put X amount of containers. Because I can't, I don't feel like I can, I, I can't predict like I could with a VM. Right. And I think that's maybe partly a result of the, the you know, the different philosophies behind this. Because I think if you were, you were probably, you'd probably have already instrumented your system, right? You'd have a bunch of stuff. So you would, you build the box and then you would go test how many containers you run. Mm. And you'd probably then be able to run more containers than you could VMs. But you're right, you don't have the same sort of heuristics and understandings that you do. But I wouldn't be able to say, well, if I can run four VMs, I can run 10 containers. It's just, there's just not that math. You can't right. do that. Yeah. And as this article points out, they, you know, because 
it's nice that you don't have multiple kernels in some senses. Yes. But it means that a lot of, you know, you might need to do more tuning because you have a deep, more deeply nested system or the kernel is doing more nested things than in the VM model. Mm-hmm. Um, so like they're running into stuff where, you know, your the regular Docker networking setup involves a whole bunch of NAT. Uh, and then that's going to involve the contract table and IP table so you can keep track of all the connections that are going, right, as you map onto the Docker subnet and yes. all, all that. Yes. Um, so at some point, that'll just start dropping packets if you have too many. It'll and be, it's yeah. like, how do you know, right? I mean, there's tunables. You can go play with it. If you're already doing a lot of Linux kernel you know, optimization, maybe you know, but probably but, you don't. Probably you just mm, ran a bunch of containers no, and you have to go. Yeah. You have to be instrumenting and monitoring your system if you're going to even see those problems. That's one of those... It's a combination of the driver, of the hardware, of your specific kernel version, of the software that's talking to the kernel. Like, it's such a unique blend that the only way you'll get real data and any kind of predictability is to just do it in production. But that, to me, seems crazy, because what you're proposing is just throw it up there and see how it performs. And ideally, you over-provision, so you know it's going to perform well, and maybe you can add... Sometimes things don't go ideally, and all of a sudden you've thrown a box up there that isn't fast enough. We've, we've had something similar happen to us where we put it in production. It's like, that's ah, not quite fast enough. We kind of expected it to be a little better, and now what do we do? And it's just like we don't really have like a super solid answer now. Yeah, that's true. That's true. We need more. I mean, some point we just need more resources. More hardware. Yeah. Uh, but w- because we kind of, I, I mean... I don't know. It seemed like, it seemed like on paper it, would be, it was going to be plenty of horsepower. And then in actual production, and maybe it's the, maybe the cloud provider isn't really giving us quite what the spec says they were. Because if you, I, I feel like if we ran that same workload on physical hardware, it would be faster. That's a good the question. The same specs, right? The same specs on physical hardware. So there's that, yeah, there's that there variability too when you're, on, when you're on... Someone else's computers. Yeah. One other thing I thought was funny from this is uh, they also started running into issues when they ran out of PIDs on the system. Sure. Right, and that's, it's eventually going to happen. It's eventually going to happen. Yeah, so it's another one. Uh, this is just a fun, good article to check out if you are going to run any large number of containers, and it points you to some nice little kernel values you can tweak and tune that you might need. Where do people find that, Wes? Where where would I find links for this week's episode? Oh, like yeah. that microphone we talked about. Like that microphone. Well, you can go on over to coder.show, specifically coder.show slash 369 for uh-huh. this week's episode. But you'll also find ways to get in touch. You just hit the contact button. And the easiest way to make sure you always get fresh Coder Radio is, of course, just, just subscribe. You know, we're on all the apps. We're pretty much everywhere. Mm-hmm. That's true. Really, that's where the show notes are, really, is in the app, too. Yeah, it's let's, in, it's let's in the honest. apps. We've got, like, chapters and stuff, too, so you can skip right to the, your favorite part of the show if you only have a little bit of time. Those are pretty sweet. Yeah, they are lot especially like when i'm going back to like what stupid thing did i say like a year ago yeah, yeah it's make it it's super great for just trying to reference like oh yeah which mic did chris say yeah there you go pop pop right over there huh yeah now of course you can also just go to jupiterbroadcasting.com where we've got a whole other selection of fine programs can people find you on the twitter yeah they can at west Payne, and i think you're there too i am at chris las linux action show how how uh, retro is that tweet me your ideas for a new End of handle. Right, we'll spruce the whole thing up. Yeah, fresh it up for the new year. I think uh, Joe probably votes Chris Lynn. Uh We'll see what Mr. Dominic says when he comes yeah, back. Yeah, we'll see. So do stay tuned. Well, you know, we do this show live this week. It was a little late maybe, but don't worry. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. You can find out when we are here live. We'd love to have you join. Mm-hmm. Until then, we'll see you next episode.